Uh, but tonight, we're hosting Pat Thomas. Pat Thomas is the author of Listen Whitey, The Sounds of Black Power, 1965 to 1975. He was a consultant to the PBS documentary, The Black Panthers, Vanguard of the Revolution. He has lectured at USC, Evergreen, Straight, Evergreen State, and the universities of Copenhagen, Oslo, and East London. He curated the book, Invitation to Openness, the Jazz, and Soul Photography of Les McGann, 1960-1980, and compiled an Allen Ginsberg box set, The Last Word on First Blues. Tonight, he's here to discuss his new book, Did It, uh, from Jerry Rubin from Yippie the Yippie and American Revolution. So please welcome Pat Thomas. Yeah. Well, it's great to see a lot of, I think I know everybody in the room. <laughs> Is there anybody I don't know? You owe money to most of us. That's, that's, that's right. Um, so people ask me, you know, wh why Jerry Rubin? Uh, I like to move around as I talk. So people like to ask me, you know, you know how this Jerry Rubin book came about, and uh, I had a brother who was 10 years older than me, and so when I was about 10, he brought a copy of Steal This Book into my life, and this was about 1973, and man, I thought that was the funniest friggin' thing I'd ever read, <laughs> you know, blowing stuff up, and pranking people, and getting, you know, free phone calls, and... Um, so, you know, for most of us, you know, uh, you know, Abby Hoffman was funnier than Jerry, a little more charismatic, and of course, you know, Abby went underground, and that made him almost mythological, and Jerry put on a suit and tie, and that wasn't cool, and, you know, so over the last five years, I've been on this incredible journey, which is, you know, like, you know, who was Jerry Rubin, and, and, uh, and again, one of the reasons I didn't do Abby is there's already about five or six books out there about Abby, there's plenty of Abby. And so I went back to college late in life. I'm a recent graduate of Evergreen State College out of Olympia, mm -hmm. which is a total radical, you know, lefty, you know, reality doesn't exist at Evergreen. And uh, being a slightly older student, I was pretty much friends with the teachers. And so one of them pulled me aside and they said, uh, hey, dude, you're too smart, you're too old to be, uh, you know, in the classroom, what would you like to do? Uh, you could stay home for a semester and, and do something else. And I said, well, you know, I'd love to do a biography of Jerry Rubin because it's never been done. And so this was, you know, more of like a college essay, although it was, uh, I think I wrote 40,000 words. And, uh, you know, all, of course, secondary material. And I put out, as many of you know, I put out this book called Listen Whitey about the Black Panthers. And that caused a little bit of a media sensation. So my publisher took me out for lunch one day and he says, you know, what would you like to do next? And I said, well, I'd like to publish this Jerry Rubin thing. I think we could do it as a $9.99 paperback, right? Mm -hmm. And he's like, no. He goes, I want a giant coffee table book <laughs> about Jerry Rubin. <laughs> so I went to visit Jerry Rubin's uh, ex-wife, and she said, you know, when Jerry died in 1994, I just went through his apartment, I put everything in boxes, and I haven't looked at it since. I've got a warehouse full of Jerry Rubin shit. And uh, she said, I've seen your Black Panther book. I think it's good. And so she said, why don't you move in with me? <laughs> I said, hmm, interesting. Now, she's been since remarried, and her husband looks at the two of us like we're two Martians, right? They've just beamed down. And he's like, uh, he says, you know, I knew Jerry. He goes, I used to run Studio 54. And uh, he's not the famous guys who got busted for coke and not paying their taxes, but he took over... Studio 54 just after them, and you know, has all the same Liza Manella and Binaka, Binaka Jagger stories that they have. But mm -hmm. anyway, I moved in and I started going through all of Jerry's stuff, and Jerry never threw anything out. And he had canceled checks going all the way back to 1970. Uh, there was, you know, when the Chicago 8 trial was happening, they, uh, you know, they were on bail, so they could leave town on weekends, and he kept track of all of their speaking engagements, you know, like $500 paid from Rutgers, you know, $600 paid from Harvard. And, you know, along the way, 
you know, all of these weird tales were happening. For example, uh, the Stone 69 tour, you know, the Ultima tour, uh, or Gimme Shelter tour, if you will, took place in the same amphitheater that the 68 Democratic Convention took place. And so Abby went to see Jagger the night of that gig and said, hey, Mick, you know what happened here uh, a, few, a few months ago, right? And Jagger goes, yeah. And Abby goes, how about some money for the Chicago 8 trial? And Jagger's like, no, dude, I don't think so. Uh, but it turned out that Jagger's limo driver at night that was like taken to the Playboy Mansion was Judge Julius Hoffman's limo driver in the daytime. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, talk about some weird coincidences, right? And I also found out, if you know anything about the Chicago 8 trial, you know, Judge Julius Hoffman was almost a car cartoon character of evil, right? He, he talked in this cranky voice, and he was, you know, I don't know, well into his 70s. You know, it turned out that, you know, 20 years earlier, he had declared, or 15 years earlier, he declared Naked Lunch as a legitimate book. You know, there had been these <laughs> pornographic trials. Uh, Burroughs. You know, Burroughs. William Burroughs, right? So, so you realize that not everybody is as evil as, as you think they are. And, you know, along my journey, I also discovered that Jerry Rubin, who we, you know, think of in the 80s as a yuppie, he's been called a Reaganite, he's been called this, that, and the other. You know, it turned out that Jerry was a liberal Democrat. He never supported Reagan, just like his buddy Tom Hayden, you know, he put on a tie. Turned out that Jerry was never a stockbroker. He was marketing green energy, solar panels, and ecology on Wall Street. He was not trying to get you to buy extra shares of Exxon. Um, and the other thing, you know, along the way is you realize, uh, you know, and I see this on social media, which is the lack of empathy, right? In other words, someone will say, like, hey, man, you know, I just got the new Al Cooper album, and then someone will go, well, I heard, I heard Al slapped his girlfriend in 1973. Man, you shouldn't be listening to that album. But, I mean, I see this type of shit on social media all day long. Everybody's an armchair uh, critic. Everybody's holier than thou. And, you know, Jerry Rubin, you know, really laid his ass out on the line. And it all started when he arrived at UC, UC Berkeley in 1964 as a grad student. It was the height of the free speech movement. He quickly got caught up in that. He dropped out of grad school within weeks, and he started showing up at these free speech movement uh, meetings, and people thought he was a cop because he was still clean-shaven, and he was asking a million questions, right? <laughs> and again, you know, these weird parts of history, it turns out that he went to Cuba during this time, and he went there with Susie Rotolo. Famous for being on the front cover of the Free Willing Bob Dylan. <coughs> and so Susie remembers, remembers uh, Jerry as a giant pain in the ass because when they got to meet Fidel Castro and Che Guevara, Jerry was asking too many questions. But famously, Che Guevara said, you know, to Jerry, he said, man, I wish, I wish I was with you in North America. North America is the heart of the belly of the beast. And so Jerry came back to... Uh, Berkeley, sort of energized by what was going on in Cuba, and he started something called the VDC, the Vietnam Day Committee. And when you see those, you know, the, the, the troops going to Vietnam, if any of you watched the recent Ken Burns thing, the Port of Oakland was the exit point to send all of our boys off to die, and the troop trains were running through Berkeley, and it was Jerry and his friends who got the idea, excuse me, to lay down on the troop trains. Uh, he's responsible for that. And then in another weird rock and roll connection, it turns out that Marsha Hunt used to march side by side with Jerry at UC Berkeley, uh, which I had no idea about. Um, and so Jerry was also, although Abby Hoffman is, is, is better known in, in 2017 than Jerry as Jerry's been sort of forgotten, it turns out that, that Abby was basically an unknown guy. He, he had gone down to uh, the South and it, you know, it was registering you know, blacks for, uh, for voter registration. So, but he was still an unknown guy, just kind of hanging out in the streets of Manhattan. When he sees Jerry on the front page of the newspaper in 1966, Jerry was subpoenaed by HUAC, the House on american Activities Committee. And if you've ever taken a political science class, you may remember Joseph McCarthy, the great commie witch hunter, right? Many people were called in front of McCarthy, and they were 
scared, and then some refused to talk. <clears throat> the jury did something that no one else had ever done. The jury rented a Revolutionary War uniform <laughs> from a store, and he showed up in Congress handing out copies of the Declaration of Independence. And he literally shut down Congress for a day. Right? And Abby Hoffman read, saw that, and he thought, Jesus Christ, man, this mofo's crazy. I want to meet this guy, right? So Jerry gets a call from Dave Dellinger, who was a pacifist, you know, older than the rest of these guys, but even, even protesting World War II. He says, Jerry, I want you to move to New York because uh, I want to march on Washington. So Jerry gets to New York and, and you know, somehow, you know, without the beauty of Facebook or the internet, Jerry magically meets Al Hoffman in the first 24 hours that they're in New York. This is uh, mid-67. And Abby says, you know, he says the heart of the military industrial complex is, 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 is the New York Stock Exchange, right? That's, that's where everyone's buying and selling shares of, of Bell helicopters and whatever. He said, you know, there's a balcony up there where you can look down, you can watch the traders trading. He goes, let's get $500 worth of $1 bills, and we're going to go up there, and we're going to throw all the money down onto the floor. And so Jerry and Abby and a bunch of other guys did this. And, you know, it could take a nuclear bomb, right, to shut down the New York Stock Exchange. No, it took $500 of $1 bills because all the traders stopped trading, and they're picking up this money. And again, that was front page news. And when they went back the next week, there was bulletproof glass installed where that balcony was, right? So, you know, again, you know, these guys, Jerry, Jerry and Abby, the two of them, you know, they're, they're changing the face of the media, they're changing the face of protest. And so Dave Dillinger said, we're going to march down to Washington. He said, we're going to march on the Capitol building. And Jerry said, you know, once again, that's not the heart of the military industrial complex. It's in Arlington, Virginia. It's, it's the Pentagon. And Abby, you know, was smoking on a big fatty, and he said, you know, man, let's try to levitate that thing. Uh. Right? <laughs> and so, you know, these guys, you know, they didn't have a Twitter account. They didn't have any way to spread their message. So LBJ hears about this, and LBJ says, I'll be goddamned if I'm going to let a couple of hippies levitate the Pentagon. Well, that becomes front page news. And Jerry, on the next day, it says, hey, LBJ, we only, we only had about 5,000 people who knew about this event. But thanks to you, we got 30 million that are into it. And sure enough, that became the front of the Time magazine that week. And in another story that shows that, you know, truth is stranger than fiction, Jerry was called down to D.C. before the event by, uh, you know, like the Park Service, and they, and they actually negotiated of how high they could actually levitate the Pentagon. The Park Service says, you know, we're only going to let you guys do this you know, for like two feet. Right? Um, so, so, you know, these are the, are the types of things, uh, you know, that I found out. And I also found out how much Norman Mailer loved Jerry. And when uh, Mailer wrote Armies of the Night, he had, uh, he had Jerry... Um, he had Jerry edit it for him. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dive in now a little bit to the entertainment portion of the program, and I'm going to play you uh, a couple of snippets of things. <laughs> 